Hello, fellow split, splitting geniuses. Welcome to our Splitting Smart webinar, where Heather and I have candid and informative discussions with divorce and well being professionals. So our goal is to provide you with the knowledge on various modalities of support that can help you to unhitch with fewer hitches. After all, knowledge is the antidote to fear. And today's guest brings us a wealth of knowledge for anyone facing a military divorce or separation. We will cover everything from jurisdictional issues, the divorce lingo around military divorce, to understanding the nuances of military retirement systems, pension division, health, GI benefits, and, rel and related reporting systems. So hopefully, for those of you facing a military divorce, this will be this will help shed some light and insight on how to navigate the process and who you could use to help you get through this transition. I'm Lila Aiken Ali, a divorcee, divorce coach, and the founder of Split FYI. Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Steer, a divorcee, a CDFA, also a divorce coach, and the co founder of Split FYI. And before we introduce our next guest, I just want to highlight um, some of our protocols when we're doing a webinar. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, um, either a Q&A box or a chat box. You can put questions along the way in there. We'll probably um, go through the presentation and then we definitely will have time at the end to answer questions. So I will be monitoring that. Uh, throughout our discussion. If, if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll jump in and we can ask the question then, but otherwise um, we'll definitely cover anything that shows up there um, afterwards. If you are watching this as a recording, you're also welcome to um, put comments or questions in the chat and we will be providing um, David Smith's contact for you to be able to reach out to him directly as well as a fantastic resource um, and expert in this area. So without further ado, um, today's guest is David Smith, uh, a friend and colleague of, of mine for, gosh, I think David, we met four years ago. Um, and sure. something like that, I think, yeah. Yeah. So he's a CDFA also, and also a chartered financial consultant and a certified quadro specialist. Um, he is also a 20-year United States Air Force um, veteran and retired officer. Thank you so much for your service, David. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, and he's also a Florida uh, Supreme Court certified mediator um, and collaboratively trained financial professional. So um, all of this has positioned him to be an expert, particularly in the field of military divorces. Um, and he does non-military as well, but uh, he is definitely has a, a, an amazing reputation in this space. So it's so great to have you with us, David. Thank you so much for taking your time today to um, work through this. This is definitely has a lot of special uh, nuances to it. So looking forward to this great material. Thank you very much, Heather. And uh Lila, I believe I got that correct. You did, you did. <laughs> uh, yeah, very happy to be here this afternoon. And yes, as mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about military divorce as lots of nuances and complexities and pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. But my goal, what I'm hoping today is to um, help increase your uh, the listeners, the folks that are here today or watching this later on, increasing their confidence that they uh, as they go through the process themselves or know someone that does, maybe they can help them out or also know um, maybe some better questions to ask too as they're going through the process. So we'll just dive right in, okay? Perfect. All right. So you've already heard a little bit about me. This just happens to be my contact information and I live in the Northwest part of Florida, Panama City, the panhandle we call it here and also known as uh, the world's most beautiful beaches, which is what the uh, Chamber of Commerce likes to say. And they are pretty, they really are uh, nice. And um, as Heather mentioned, um, I served for 20 years in the Air Force. I retired in uh, 2002, right here where I'm living right now was the base where I retired from. And I served that entire 20 year period practicing actually as a dentist. So I transitioned from my dental career into financial services, which I've been doing about 15 years. 
And I truly love to help my clients to get a very uh, good understanding and clear picture of their entire financial blueprint. So are military divorces different? They sound like a silly question, but they definitely are. Uh, when you look at the map here, you can, uh, when we talk jurisdiction, first of all, I'm not an attorney, of course, but you've got choices as to whether you, where, where you file, what state do you file in? Is that where you're currently living or due to military orders, domicile, state of residence, all these types of things. And the best person to speak with about getting those questions answered is, of course, an attorney that's in one of those several states that you might be considering. Because each state's a little different when it comes to how they divide up uh, pensions and so forth. So that's a very big decision uh, to be made at the beginning. And Lila went through a lot of the other things that we're going to be covering today, topics like uh, SBP, Survivor Benefit Program, TRICARE, Pension Division, uh, Post 9-11, uh, GI Bill benefits and those kinds of things. So let, we'll get into a few more specifics here. So there actually are or is more than one military system. Uh, there's active duty system. There's systems that reservists can retire under. You can also retire with a medical disability, but we're going to be focusing today just on active duty retirement. So when you... Um, are thinking about this or initially when the retirement systems came out, it was funded only by the government and there wasn't anything that the military member was contributing as far as to their retirement. That's changed a little bit and I want to talk about that in a moment when we get uh, to that particular part of the presentation. But looking at what someone is paid after they retire, they have a basic monthly benefit they're going to receive. If they qualify, they can be receiving potentially some non-taxable disability benefits. And if the military member has chosen or made the election, there can also be a survivor annuity for eligible beneficiaries that would pay for the rest of that particular person's life. So of course the military member's compensation continues as long as they're living. So when you're looking at how their retired pay is calculated, you need to know several things. The date that they actually came into entered active duty in that system that they're under, which we're gonna go in a few more details here in a moment. What their base pay, what they were actually being paid at the time of retirement, or it might be actually the base pay at the time of the divorce, which is, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later too. And there's some federal statutes that define a multiplier, which also comes into play as to how much they'll be paid. So this might be a little hard for you to read. I apologize if it is, but the gist of this is on the left-hand side in the gray boxes are various times that someone might have come into the military. And depending on when they came in and some decisions they made along the way, they may fall into several of these retirement plans here on the right-hand side. We're only gonna talk briefly about the high three, which is in the orange block, the redux, which is the gray one on the right, in the blended retirement system at the bottom left. Just a few details about each of those. So what's important to know about high three? Well, a high three is by definition, it's the average of the military members base pay over their last 36 months, their highest 36 months of pay, typically their last 36 months. And for the people that are in this particular high three system, they came into the service before 1986, and there's a formula as to how their retirement will be paid to them. High three is also important by definition because of in divorce. And when you're thinking about that and calculating someone's retirement pay or how it's divided at the time of divorce, the high three concept is a very important thing to know. So you might have to, or there might need to be the, the need to accumulate 36 months of LESs, which are leave and earning statements for the military member. So there's a lot of discovery, there's a lot of documentation and so forth that needs to be brought together for this. The next system is the Redux system. And for those people that actually had 12 years of service as of the end of 2017, and if they accepted a bonus, that would have put them into the Redux system. So there's, there's a few less people in the system because of the choices they would have had to have made. 
But again, it's just important to know what military system the person is under when you're looking at their ultimate retirement pay. And here's the big difference. This blended retirement system started for those people that came on January the 1st of 2018. Prior to this, in the previous systems that I was describing, they were only what's called a defined benefit plan. In other words, it was only the pension that the military member would be uh, eligible for into the future. They might have had a thrift savings plan, a TSP, which is the military's version of a 401k. Uh, but that money in that plan was only coming from the military member. In the blended retirement system, it actually combines both the pension system and the TSP, Thrift Savings Plan, which is called a defined contribution plan, because now the government is contributing to the military's member's ultimate retirement. They get all of, automatically enrolled into the TSP. The multiplier for this particular group of what their pension is going to be in the future is actually reduced a little bit. But to make up for that, the government is doing some contributions and even some matching, like what also uh, can happen in particular 401k plans. Um, one big difference to note here, a couple of differences. When a person in the blended retirement system, again, this is fairly new, it's only been out a few years, so you know, most people don't have it just three or four years into this plan so far. But ultimately, when they get to retirement age, assuming they stay in that long, they can actually opt to take a lump sum payment, a portion of their retirement pay as a lump sum to them. Their retirement pay gets lowered for a period of time until they reach their full Social Security retirement age then their retirement pay goes back up to what it would have been originally. Now, it's important to note that this lump sum payment is taxable. It's not like something you can roll over to an IRA. So you can spread out and they can spread that out over a four year period to help to reduce the taxes. So that's an option that blended retirement system members have that others don't. And also between their eighth and 12th year, they can be eligible for what's called a continuation bonus. That's to encourage them to continue on staying in. So you have to kind of consider this, of course, when you're looking at language um, and marital settlement agreements. So we're gonna continue on and jump into a little bit about the, some basics about dividing a military pension. So when you're looking at dividing retired pay, a military retired pay. It can actually be divided for just a pension that you see at the top part of the right part of the slide here. In other words, the former spouse or someone can be awarded a pension portion, but there also can be portions of retired pay that's paid as spousal support, alimony, or child support. So all three of those things can be accessed through the military retirement pay system. But to actually get it, there's different paperwork that has to be filed and different processes that have to be followed. So when it comes to dividing the pension itself, uh, I think Heather mentioned that I was a Quadro specialist. Quadro is the document that, the legal document you have to have to be able to divide retirement accounts such as 401ks and 403bs. But that paperwork, a Quadro does not apply to dividing military retirement pay. It actually has a different terminology this military retirement pay division order. So that's what actually has to be done to divide the retirement pay. If you're gonna receive some of the members retirement pay for child support, you have to do what's called an income deduction or an income withholding order. If you're going to receive some of the retired pay for spousal support or alimony, you have to do what's called a garnishment order. So it's just a little different process and different paperwork, but there's different monies for different reasons that can be paid out. So some of you might have heard that if you were ever told that a, a military member's pension couldn't be divided on this, you'd been married at least 10 years. That statement is, is absolutely false. Okay, this is what the actual rule is. If the non-military uh, spouse, the military member, if they've been married for 10 years or more, and the military member has at least 10 years of service 
credited toward eligibility, they meet what's called a 1010 rule. And if that 1010 rule is met and the pension is divided, then payments can come directly to the former spouse from, an, from a, a big building out there, a big organization called DFAS. That's the Defense Finance and Accounting Service. And they handle, of course, all the pay for, uh, for retirees and so forth. And so the payments can come directly from that organization to a bank account, for example. But if the 1010 rule is not met and you're uh, awarded a portion of the pension, then there's got to be some other way or some decision and discussion about how the former spouse will actually receive their portion of the benefit. So that's an important rule to know. And what about the maximum amount of a military member's pay that actually can be paid to the former spouse? Is that 50% or what's that number? Well, it's partially true that the maximum is 50% because if you're dividing a person's military retirement pay as property, then yes, 50% is that number. But if you add some of that in for spouse support or child support, it can go up to as much as 65% of the military members disposable retired pay is the definition that um, they could receive. So I, I have, know a, I'm going I have a question on this one. Sure. So understanding, so 50% is the maximum. So a person in, in the civilian world, you could negotiate all of your retirement over to the other spouse. So in this case, you really it's 50% is the max from a property division negotiation mm -hmm, that the true. military will allow you to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions right now from either of you? If not, we'll continue on. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about disability. Um, there's some things to note about disability. One very important thing to note is that the disability benefit that a military member, retired military member receives belongs to them. That is not divisible. That amount of the disability benefit they're receiving is not divisible in a divorce. So for example, like in my case, I have a 20% disability from my military service. So I'm receiving my military pay. So I get so much of my base pay as my retired pay and I'm getting so much of my pay as non-taxable disability pay. So that's kind of offset. If my disability rating goes up, I, my disability payment goes up, my retired pay goes down. So um, that's until the retirement uh, disability rating gets up to 50% and things change, but that's, we won't need, we can't get into all those details today. There's definitely differences in every case. But what's good to know about this particular Supreme Court decision from 2017 is that a judge cannot order a military retiree to make up for that reduction in pay when their disability rating goes up and their base pay goes down. For example, if a former spouse was awarded, say, $500 from pay, and then, and that was me, and then if I get an increased disability rating, my monthly pay goes down, that's going to decrease the amount that actually the former spouse receives. But so the judge cannot order that to be made up. But you can have some language in the actual settlement agreement that can say, if this happens, then what will actually happen for that pay difference to be made up? I have a and there's a and there's a link, of course, you can go to that if you'd like to read about it. Sure. Uh, you know, in regards to this, and this is just coming from, does this happen automatically? So if that were to happen, and the pay is five hundred, and then the disability goes up, and this goes down, does this automatically happen that the pay goes down? will be reduced to the former spouse. Yeah, no, I said $500. If a specific dollar amount is awarded, mm -hmm. you know, which I said that's, but if it was, it's really a percentage. If that percentage right. happened to be $500, then it would adjust. If it was a dollar amount, 
it normally would not because they're, they're awarded a flat dollar amount. Um, but yes, it automatically happens. When it gets adjusted for the military member, it will automatically happen for the former spouse receiving the benefit. So it's almost beneficial to do a dollar amount, is it not? Or that's just- Well, <laughs> if you do a dollar amount, the downside to that is you do not um, benefit from any COLAs, cost of living allowances. Got it if a dollar specific dollar amount is awarded. If a percentage is awarded, you do benefit from cost of living adjustments as the military member does as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. All righty. So here's another uh, a bit that comes into play. So this is describing what's called the frozen benefit rule. Can everybody, can you see that okay on the screen? Okay. So President Obama signed this close to the end of 2016. The NDAA is actually the National Defense Authorization Act, which is passed every single year, talks about how the military is going to be funded and it changes and all that kind of stuff. But here is the big thing that occurred. Um, it changed the definition of disposable retired pay because now what happens is the in the case when you're dividing this retired pay as property, when the military member has not yet retired, then their income is actually, or their disposable income, the definition of that is actually then limited or defined by the amount that they were being paid at the time of the divorce. So it's their pay grade and years of service at the time of the divorce. So basically that means that the ultimate benefit that the former spouse would receive is frozen as of the date of the divorce. They will not uh, benefit from the member's promotions, longevity pay, increased time and service, and that sort of thing. They will benefit from COLAs, cost of living allowances, but they will not benefit from promotions and so forth. So that's a huge change that occurred uh, from that National Defense Authorization Act. So it's basically dividing your retirement earned as of the date of the divorce. All righty, how are we doing on time? Just checking. We're doing fantastic. Great. I know this is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things and we're about to jump in even more stuff because we're gonna get into acronyms and lingo and forms and programs and all sorts of stuff. But again, the whole idea is to introduce the concepts, introduce the language, introduce the thoughts and ideas, and give you th things to consider and think about, which are all important in a military divorce. All right. So let's see if you guys recognize this fellow. You might recognize him from before. Uh, Buzz, gosh, I haven't looked, uh, haven't seen Toy Story in quite a while. But, uh, but remember, he used to always say, what did he say? To infinity and beyond. And that's pretty much where we're about to go here <laughs> is uh, jumping into all the rest of these things. But hang on, it'll be okay. Everybody will make it just fine. So the first part, what is DEERS and why is it important? Well, as you can see on the screen here, the Defense Enrollment and Eligibility Reporting System. What is that? It's just a huge database of information. It's all this stuff for people that are in the military, uh, civilians, family members, all that sort of thing. Why is it important? Well, first of all, it's important because of that, because of all the information. But also, if you meet certain rules for health insurance eligibility, which I'm gonna talk about shortly, this is definitely a place, an organization that the former spouse needs to reach out to within 30 days of the divorce being finalized or even prior to that to start asking some questions and you see the phone number there, but you need to reach out to them or they would need to re reach out to them and find out about health insurance eligibility and how the records would actually need to be updated or changed post-divorce. So an important place to know how to contact them. And what is, and a lot of, 
but folks might know this already, but in case you don't, an LES is a leave and earnings statement, which of course active duty military members receive twice a month. They get mid month and end of the month has tons of information on it. I, I don't have an example for you for an active duty one. I do have an example for a retiree, uh, but it shows the pay that they're entitled to. Of course, taxes, if they're state taxes, Florida, we don't have any state taxes, but obviously uh, if, uh, for uh, federal, as far as active duty deductions, allotments, that term actually means payments to somebody else. Like if there's money that's going to a savings account, or if you're paying for a life insurance uh, policy, for example, or child support, those are all what's called allotments. And those will be shown on the person's leave and earning statement. A lot of information there. And here's some examples of what someone would see on an LES. Uh, the base pay, of course, which is just the, the, the basic pay that anybody at date, same date of rank and years of service is gonna receive. If they, they may receive, be receiving flight pay if they qualify for that. There might be some bonuses that they receive periodically over the course of their career. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're also going to see what's called the BAH, the basic allowance for housing, because they military members, of course, receive an allowance depending on where they're living and rank and so forth, I believe. And also the BAS allowance for subsistence. That's a uh, hundred, I'm not sure what it is now, maybe $140 or so a month. It's basically for food, it's grocery money. But both of those, the BAH and BAS are non-taxable benefits. So all this that's received, there's no tax paid on any of that. Um, the DEEMS is the acronym for the date of initial entry into military service. So remember back a few slides ago, I was describing the different systems that someone can be under, retirement systems. So that DEEMS date, the date they initially came into service is gonna drive what system that they're, um, that, they under, that they're under, what they fall under. Now, what does leave balance mean? That's just a fancy word for vacation time. So vacation time can be accumulated and so much can be carried forward. But when you're thinking about in divorce, you have all these assets and debts and all this marital property or community property, depending on what state you're in, separate property, et cetera. What goes in the bucket of actually what's gonna be divided? Well, if, you, if a person, a military member has a large vacation balance they've carried over, there's value, there's dollar value to that. So you would actually need to do a calculation or have someone do a calculation of what that's worth. And that could be in the conversation for division later on. There's also a section on the leave and earning statement for thrift savings plan. So you can see the percentage of contributions that the military members making. And actually there are two kinds of Roth, uh, excuse me, there are two kinds of thrift savings plans. You have the type where you put money in and it actually reduces your taxable income but it's taxable when it comes out to the person later on, or a Roth, which you might've heard of a Roth IRA. It works kind of similar, but this is the Roth thrift savings plan. Money goes in, doesn't reduce the person's taxable income, but hey, the nice thing about this is if you meet certain rules and requirements, when it comes out, zero income tax to be paid. So that's a very, very nice benefit. And the person, military member, gets to choose how they want that money to go. And it's important to differentiate that because the valuation on that is different. Exactly. You... But yeah, it's a good point, Heather, because one, of course, is going to have tax considerations and the other one uh, typically does not. So, and what's SGLI? That's the Service Members Group Life Insurance. Did, did, aren't these acronyms just great? Now, if it's something like the Navy, they get even longer for some of the stuff. These things might be similar, but organizationally, Navy uses a lot uh, longer acronyms. But this is just straightforward term insurance. So there can be term insurance on the military member. There might be coverage on their spouse, and there might be also coverage for their children as well. And then on the LES, typically there is an actual pay date, the date that they entered active duty. And this might be different. It's different from deems because they might have had a break in service. Like if they came out of service, went out of service and came back in, the pay date 
um, will typically be different. So there's lots of stuff, as you can see on this slide, as well as on the LAS. Now let's turn to what I get every month as a retiree, the monthly retiree account statement. So that's my pay stub, same kind of thing, shows my retirement pay, shows if I have any deductions, allotments that might be going out. If I'm, um, I'm not gonna show you my particular one, I do have an example, but if a person is receiving disability pay, um, if what kind they're getting and how much that is. And also, we haven't talked about this yet, but SBP is an acronym for Survivor Benefit Program. And, um, and I'm gonna get into a few more details, but the basic, that's basically, are there gonna, payments gonna to continue to a former spouse once the military member passes away if they die first. So what does an RAS look like? Well, here is an example. So you can see the, there's an effective date, the period that's covered up here on the top left. Of course, the information for the person is here, then the next block. The contact information for the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, toll-free numbers are there on the top right-hand side. I'm just gonna point out a couple of different areas here. And if I go on mute, I'll apologize for a moment because I might have a call come in and I don't want it to interrupt anything. So bear with me, hang on just a second. I apologize for this. I'll be right back. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. So the other interesting thing on here to note is there's the contact details for um, getting information um, by either yourself or if you are the military spouse um, or the military spouse can request information. Um, and there is a login um, detail so they can get some back reporting um, as well, which, <clears throat> which can be helpful um, right. to know about as well. And I apologize for that brief, uh, brief step away. So coming back to some very important information that's on here, of course, you see there how they're filing and how they're withholding for exemptions. But this particular individual, because the survivor benefit plan coverage block at the bottom here, it doesn't have any information in it. So this person did not make that election. So there's nothing here to be seen. But if they had had made that election, you would see what benefit they had chosen and how far along they are in making payments because uh, there are premium payments for this particular program. So there's good information on the retiree account statement concerning the survivor benefit plan. So if you go to the back, what you'll see here is there is an allotment, a deduction for TRICARE, which is the medical insurance program, which you can see is pretty reasonable per month for this particular person, $25. And this arrears of pay is if the military member passes away, the retired military member passes away and there's still money owed uh, from their retirement pay, who would that actually go to? So this would say who that person or persons had, that has been named. Okay. All righty. A DD-214, very, very, very important document for those folks that have either retired from the military or say they had some maybe uh, prior service as an enlisted person, came back in um, as, an, as an officer, then this document is gonna show some very, very important dates. So dates of when they came in service, when they came and total time in service. It also has a lot of other things like schools and medals and awards and things which don't necessarily apply in divorce. But this is a specific and important document to try to locate, know about, and it might even have to be requested if you can't find it. And that might take a while. Sometimes requesting these documents takes you know, quite a bit of time. Um, just kind of an, as, as an, a separate aside, I put this on this slide, but as a reminder, sometimes when you just sit down and you kind of write out a history of where you've lived and where... Um, you and your spouse have been assigned to major events that have occurred in your life and marriages and so forth and so on, it can help your team, the people that are helping you uh, to go through the divorce process. It can certainly have a, a provide a lot of great background information for them as well. So that's just kind of a nice thing to be able to do or 
or have available for someone. All right, so we're gonna dive just a couple of slides into the uh, survivor benefit plan. I mentioned before, what happens when the service member passes away? Well, if the service member has made the election and they have identified who they want the beneficiary to be, then this is a payment of 55% of the benefit that they have elected for that beneficiary's lifetime, okay? But the service member does not make this election until they retire. And normally there's very few instances where that actually, that election can be changed. So these are one, this is one of the areas in a divorce that can be discussed and so forth and considered whether or not um, the former spouse or anyone's going to receive their survivor benefit in case the service member, excuse me, uh, military member passes away first. An important date, a thing to know, when someone, when a service member passes away, the, um, excuse me, in a divorce is what I meant to say, to go from a spouse to a former spouse, there has to be paperwork filed for the, for the former spouse or the person that's the SBP beneficiary to actually be awarded that, um, or DFRAS has to have that information. So you see here on the slide, within one year of the divorce, this paperwork needs to be filed or that beneficiary was not gonna have any claim to that benefit as an SPP beneficiary. So that's definitely an important date and a key to note. And there's a great link here that will take you to the DFAS website and give you some more information about SPP as well. Two other things to note, if the surviving spouse is receiving their benefit and they remarry before age 55, they're gonna suspend that eligibility. Those payments would stop. But if that marriage ends, either their second spouse, that that marriage, is, that spouse passes away or that marriage is annulled or they get divorced, they could start receiving those survivor benefit payments again, okay? So there might be a gap in there. And this is really, really important. Only one spouse or former spouse can be named to get benefits. You can't have multiple people. So if there was a previous relationship, previous marriage, my military member that got divorced, and if they've already um, assigned or a previous, their first spouse was awarded the survivor benefit beneficiary status, then their secondary spouse will not have any claim to it. So you definitely need to know that. You need to go into the eyes wide open as somebody else already have this benefit or not. This is a great question to ask, um, particularly as you see military people when they get divorced do tend to end up with other military people again. So understanding, hey, the person that you're now dating, considering married, knowing if that is a part of the your options going forward, because sometimes these military personnel are still in high risk positions or whatever, and having this benefit is a part of your, you know, um, safety net in case something bad happens in your new lives together. So it's, it's good to understand this as a part of divorce and as part of potentially marrying someone who's previously been divorced. Right. You definitely want to, don't want to be caught off guard by thinking that, you know, you have the ability to do this and then you find out, no, you know, somebody's already in line ahead of you and uh, then you can't do anything about it. So good point. All righty, let's talk. Uh, we have a few slides to talk a little bit about TRICARE, which of course is a, is a big deal. This is a this is an air, a big area of discussion as well in military divorces. And we're gonna go a little bit into a couple of different rules here. Um, true, but these, these are federal laws, federal rules that are around whether or not um, a former spouse can qualify for coverage. And remember I mentioned before about the importance of contacting DEERS, that telephone number and that slide for the defense eligibility and enrollment service because if you if a 
former spouse does qualify and then their DEERS record is actually going to reflect their eligibility under their own social security number. It won't be under their military members or former spouse's social security number anymore. So I put a couple of links in here for um, all of you to, when you can, you can click on these and you can go read a little bit more about these. But the bottom line is to qualify, there's a years of marriage, years of service, and how many years those overlap. That's kind of what it boils down to of what you can actually potentially qualify for. So to get into the details about that, here's the first rule. So if there have been 20 years of marriage over, uh, with 20 years of service that the military member, at least 20 years of service and at least 20 years of marriage, and it, it, 20 years of those two periods overlap, so the 20-20-20 rule, this is like a pot of gold for the former spouse. And why? Because they get to keep their TRICARE benefits, their health insurance, their commissary benefits, which is the on-base grocery store, and then the exchange, which is kind of like the on-base department store, which doesn't charge any sales tax, and they get to keep all of those benefits for the rest of their life. Okay, so that knowing how when is the point in time in your marriage or how long you need to be married to meet the 2020-20 rule um, is something very important to know. I'm not saying it's the only thing as far as the decision of when you file and all that sort of stuff, but it's a consideration. But it's important to note that if you remarry or if you happen to be continuing to work and your employer has health insurance plan and you enroll in that, then you will lose these benefits. So within 90 days after the divorce, if you feel like you meet this and you've confirmed that with DEERS, you've confirmed your eligibility, make sure within 90 days that you have enrolled in TRICARE and don't miss that deadline. Now there's another rule slightly different, but huge consequences. The consequences are very different. 20 years of marriage, 20 years of service at least, but only 15 of those years overlap, hence the 2020-15 rule. You don't get TRICARE coverage for the rest of your life. You don't get any commissary or exchange benefits. You lose those. You only qualify for one year with TRICARE coverage. But the same thing applies if you remarry or enroll in an employer plan, you lose the benefit. Same thing applies as far as you have 90 days to enroll, confirm with DEERS if you're eligible or not. But a big, big difference those five years of overlap makes. Now, what happens if you don't qualify under either one of those two rules. Well, that's not a great thing because you don't, your choices are you can get temporary coverage for usually up to 36 months. This is similar to COBRA um, if you're working you know, with an employer. <clears throat> so you can get temporary coverage through the CHCBP, another acronym, Continued Healthcare Benefit Program, uh, but it's very expensive. You can, um, and there was a link in the, one of the slides previously where you can actually go and look and you can read up on what the current premiums are for this particular program and they're high. Uh, but again, for this one, you've only have 60 days to enroll. So you can see depending on what rule you meet or not meet, uh, whether or not you can actually uh, benefit or participate, continue to participate in the healthcare program. And the last, topic really I'd like to just um, touch on is um, one that might not get talked about very much, but the uh, post 9-11 GI Bill benefits. So if an active duty member meets certain criteria, then there are benefits, these benefits that can be transferred to their spouse or their children, but they can be transferred to their spouse while they're married these benefits cannot be transferred to a former spouse. So if they're going to be transferred for the spouse to use, it has to be done during the time that they're married. And you can kind of look at it this way. There's, the, um, there's up to 36 months of benefits, tuition, 
might even be a housing allowance, depending on whether the person's on active duty or not still. Uh, if they're on active duty, the spouse would not get any kind of housing allowance benefit, but that would be tuition and books. So you've got a dollar amount that this equates to. So you can sort of use that dollar amount to offset some other thing. Remember the bucket I was talking about, about how do you have assets and debts and how do you split things up? Well, this can be a bucket. This is the bucket of money that could be in the uh, conversation as far as uh, negotiating and agreed upon. So a couple of things of importance to note here, even though the service member might've transferred that entitlement, TOE, transfer of entitlement to their spouse, they can revoke that transfer. So they, there's nothing necessarily to keep them from doing that. If they decide to do that, they could do that. And also I'm pretty certain you can you have to confirm this uh, with the VA because that's actually where this comes from through the VA. But I believe the military member has to serve at least four more years after the transfer. Or if they don't, the government can come back and ask for a, a payment back of the benefits that have been used. So there's some real kind of tight windows or windows of opportunity where the military member meets the requirements, transfer the benefit, how much longer are they gonna be in the service and that sort of thing. But as far as revoking the transfer of, of entitlement or if they don't serve long enough and some payment has to be made back, that's where it's important to have language in the settlement agreement of how to address these particular situations. And that's where it would be I would say an important thing to, to do for, for you, someone that's going through divorce, have someone, um, a divorce professional, financial professional or someone to read through your draft settlement agreement and see if they see any gaps or questions they might have about the language that's written there. And, and what about this situation or what if that situation occurs, has the language, is there language in there to, take care of those particular situations. So that's that's really important. That's one of the things that I offer for folks is to actually read their marital settlement agreement and, um, and see if I have any questions for them and so forth. So I would suggest that that would be something that you consider doing. So that um, actually is my last slide as far as the official presentation. And I just did want to say that um, currently, my consultations, I speak with folks all over the United States, so um, I currently have a free 30-minute phone call. Folks can just contact me, reach out to me, and we can talk a little bit about their situation, and hopefully I can answer some questions for them and provide some resources or point them in the right direction and help them out in any way that I can. And so I know that has been just a boatload of stuff very, very quickly, but hopefully it's made sense and um, has flowed reasonable, <laughs> reasonably. So I'm going to take a drink of water and catch my breath for a second. <laughs> wow, David, that was amazing. Like that was, I, uh, you know, I have gone through this presentation, I think now a couple of times, heard it um, at a conference and I still continue to learn things every single time. Um, and I can't, uh, you know, reiterate what he said, definitely reach out for a free consult. Um, you always get so much good information when you talk to, you know, a professional, but particularly for military, talking to someone like David, um, you will get a, a huge amount of value out of him very quickly. Um, and he's very generous with um, his, his knowledge sharing, as you can see from today. So um, definitely do that. And um, it is, you know, military, military divorce is, is a bit, is different. And I think, you know, kind of reflecting back to that first slide where, you know, where you're stationed, where your home state is, maybe where you own property, even outside of all the retirement benefits, it matters to research what state is, is the best fit for you in your divorce that you are eligible to file in. So the military um, does have special um, residential um, kind of, they have a lot more leeway 
qualifying as a resident and getting jurisdiction in different states. So I would definitely encourage you um, to, to do that research and understand what the different nuances are where, you, where you're eligible to file. Um, but thank you, David, this has been amazing. And I'm not seeing any questions right now in Q&A, um, but I would like to also say again, please, you know, you can always put it in chats wherever you found the link to this. Um, and we'll have um, in all of the show notes, uh, we will copy out those links that he referred to in his presentation as well, so that you can just hyperlink quickly to that as well as um, all of his contact details. So um, that I think will conclude our presentation. Lila, do you have anything else? No, just uh, another thank you for the time and all that information. Um, I also have was able to listen to this the second time and I think and I encourage people to listen to it a couple of times because it is overwhelming and take it by piece by piece and it, there's a plethora of information just to get your head straight about what questions to ask when you do seek legal counsel and then I would strongly say definitely get in touch with someone if not David someone like David because that is super important to understand you know, those little nuances, but um, David, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for, again, for um, allowing me the time to spend with you guys today and to go through this information. I just, where I live, um, we have, gosh, within an hour and a half or so of here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six military bases. I mean, Northwest Florida and is, is just covered, you know, so uh, we see a, a lot of this, uh, sadly, we see a lot of, you know, these situations happening, and um, I just found with my own situation going through my own divorce years ago, there were multiple divorces in my own family. My sister was married and divorced, it was like three times, my mom and dad actually divorced and remarried each other, divorced again, you know, and, and just uh, the impact on people and long term and, and families. I mean, I, I love to, my goal or my ideal is to help folks, hopefully if they can do this by staying out of court in a collaborative type of fashion, then um, that's great. I just think that's really the best for families and, and kids in the long run. So, but, but thank you again for your time this afternoon. And um, I really enjoyed it and uh, putting everything together and, and spending some time with you guys today.